good night, good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. So we're here yet again, and you know it's been a, a very good week with some interesting topics, uh, talking about Jesus being the center of different, a different aspect of our faith. So tonight, however, we have a, a very interesting topic. Jesus, the center of the end time. Hmm. Now you know we live in the end times. Now it's a very I'm watching the new yeah. people, and I'm a bit scared. I wonder what hope is left for the children I intend to have. Well, you know, you know we have to stay tuned for that, definitely. All right. Yes. So, we have a very charismatic young woman preaching to us tonight. Mm -hmm. So, I want to hear more about this woman. Daria, tell me more. No. Her name is Karina Mohammed. Mm -hmm. She comes all the way from Piki Valley. That's now in the Google Map inside the northwest part of Trinidad. Now, Karina, she's the head AY leader for church. Mm -hmm. She's in the communications department and also the assistant church clerk. Wow. So, no, she has her work cut out for her. Karina here is passionate about youth ministry and missionary work. And the theme evangelism, be the sermon, she says it embodies. The effectiveness of witnessing. Powerful oh, so so Yes. You know that Karina is a very passionate young woman for Christ. I, I can see without a doubt that those who are listening will have a wonderful time when she, when, when she begins to speak. So without further ado, let's have Karina preaching about Jesus, Jesus the, the center, center of, of the end time. time. Good day. Today, before we delve into God's word, let's say a quick prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray now that you would abide with us and open our minds as we go through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The end time, non-coercive love. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are a people of end time Bible prophecy. Dun, dun, dun. Or, as theologians say, eschatology. We are Seventh-day Adventists believe two things concerning this. One, the movement that we are a part of was foretold in Bible prophecy. And two, we are living in the final phase of Earth's history. These beliefs, depending on how they are communicated, can either, one, illuminate, or two, darken people's minds. You see, Ellen G. White discerned the potential danger that we need to deliberately avoid in preaching last day events. One, the shortness of time should never, ever be used and as an incentive for seeking righteousness. This should not be the motive. Fear should never be the driving force to seek Jesus. You see, because Jesus is attractive. He is full of love mercy and compassion he proposes to be our friend this is very insightful and i tell you so necessary to understand and adhere to because we are called as young people to proclaim the end time prophecy jesus's love is the actuating motive that we need to keep in focus as we proclaim the end time prophecy. The core dynamic of the end time events. What are the core dynamics we can expect to see unfold in the final events of Earth's history? Here we will go a little deeper. John chapter 16 verses 1 to 4 says, They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he is offering service to God. Imagine, you going to church on a Sabbath morning and men with guns take you up bodily and put you out of the church and some of you even get killed? <laughs> wow. Essentially, he says, this is what is going to go down at the end of the world. There will be those who hold the picture of God that will drive them to kill in God's name. The theological construct will dictate violent actions. 
And let me tell you, the most crucial issue that you and I need to address is the picture of God's character that we hold in our hearts. Why? Why should we even seek to address this? Because according to God, we as humans are liable to misinterpret the character of God. So you don't just um, be born on one day and all of a sudden you know all about God. No. So therefore, we in our fickle minds misinterpret the character of God in a way that will allow us to even justify using coercion as a way to proclaim his name. In the ancient pagan form, people believed that God required suffering to appease his wrath. Sometimes it meant doing certain deeds, like inflicting self-harm, doing sacrifices. And when I say sacrifices, I mean human sacrifices. This is what we might call appeasement theology. However, let me be straight. The God of the Bible is not an appeasement God. For he says in Jeremiah chapter 19 verse 4 and 5, they have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. Hm. Notice the last phrase, nor did it enter my mind. Appeasement theology is completely foreign to God's nature. But it is deeply embedded so sadly in us as humans because we see it as a natural product for our guilt. If we hurt someone, we want to make it back in such a way that they will feel sorry for us so we do something that will hurt ourselves to get appeasement from them. This is totally opposed to what God has been teaching. When people do this, they force God's love, which is not to be so. In other words, to know God as he really is rules out coercion at all costs. Now let's go a little deeper, a different kind of power. Matthew 24 says, a list of signs of the end times. This in verse 14 is perhaps the most significant sign. And it says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations and then the end will come. You see, Jesus founded his church on the principle of non-coercive love, giving totally defined God's mode of existence. At the cross, way back on Calvary, remember, Jesus gave himself to the point of suffering and death in order to demonstrate his love for us. That love, the one and the only power, he exists for our salvation. Once we understand that non-coercive love is the foundational principle of the gospel, it is what the gospel is rooted in, then we are prepared to discern that every political and religious system that propounds coercion and force is not Christ. It is the Antichrist. And this brings us to the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation. Now, Daniel and the Revelation tell a story of Jesus' conquering deception and force with truth and love. The core logic is embedded in Bible prophecy. You see, if we miss that, we miss the whole point. Let me tell you a story. Rather, this is what Daniel says. Daniel shows us a series of world empires, and each one seeks to advance its claim to superiority by means of brute strength. And Daniel describes the self-defeating cycle of violence in Daniel chapter 8, verse 4 and 9. Hear this story. There was a ram pushing westward, northward, southward. No animal could withstand him. And a male goat, he's coming from the west. He just, he's not even touching the ground when he's coming from the west. 
he has a notable horn right between his eyes. And the ram had two horns. The goat running to the ram with furious power, confronting the ram, attacking the ram, and broke his two horns. You see, he cast him down into the ground and trampled him. And no one could have delivered the poor ram from his hand. The male goat, he grew great, strong. His large horn was broken. And four notable horns came up toward the winds of heaven. One little one came up and it grew big, exceedingly large, great toward the south east and toward the glorious land. You see in this Ram story, there are various types of languages used here. I'm not talking about foreign languages. However, I'm talking about the language of self-exaltation. Things like great, very great, exceedingly great, and even the language of power and violence. <laughs> Furious power, attack, trampled are some of the words used here to show the power and violence. You see, this ram, he advanced by force. This describes that the last kingdom in the prophetic lineup of Daniel says in verse 24 and 25, his power shall be mighty. Not by his own power shall he even rise against the prince of princes, but be broken without human means. This powerful system conquers everything in its path until it rises against who? The Prince of Princes, which is the Messiah, Christ Jesus. Broken without human means, this means that Jesus, he does not employ human structures. He does not employ force. He does not employ coercion. His weapons, <laughs> let me tell you, his weapons are truth in love. Jesus went to the cross for his enemies, for all of us as rebellious, fallen human beings. God had power over them. You feel God was just, he's some weak God. God had power over them, but he submitted to their violence. He said very clearly in John chapter 10 verse 18, he can lay down his life and pick it up again. Now, if that is not power, then I don't know what is real power. Human nature and all the kingdoms of our world operate, I dare say, on the premise of self-preservation at all costs. You ever heard kill or be killed? Well, that's simply it explaining right there. However, there is good news. Hmm, there is good news. All anti-love forces are crushed by Jesus' love. In Revelation, when we come into the book of Revelation, the same story is played out with the same themes, which is love conquering evil. However, God rules by self-sacrificing love, as we already established. His dominion arises from the fact that he has laid down his life for us. John describes what is going on in the throne room of heaven. Oh, how beautiful that must be. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. He sits on the throne forever and ever. Well, you know, the old serpent, the devil, he would want to make war with Jesus. And he will wage war with Jesus. And also we, his professed followers. But, you feel this story ending bad? No, there is a happy ending. Because they will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The word of their testimony. In the story of Jesus, true winners win by losing because non-violent love is the deep secret principle of true conquest it's a love that refuses to respond with 
evil for evil. It's a love that submits to abuse rather than resorting to abuse. It's a love that would rather die than hate the haters. You see, in Revelation chapter 13, we encounter the sea beast, the land beast, Roman Catholicism, and Protestant America. The prophecy warns that these powers will eventually unite. And you all know exactly what they're uniting for. To enforce upon the world the mark of the beast. Worship laws will be enacted that will seek to coerce conscience in the name of God. Religious liberty will eventually be overturned. And the lamb-like beast will speak like a dragon. Protestant America will become the political engine that will bring upon the world a crisis of individual conscience and character. The system will dictate that no one may buy or sell except those who have the mark of the beast. In other words, the system will leverage its economic power against all who would resist its dominance. As we went through this entire discourse, you understand that there are two types of powers on display in Revelation. The lamb power versus the dragon power. Hmm. The power employed by Satan and the earthly systems that follow, they lead as we established in force and coercion. In total contrast, the power employed by Jesus Christ is self-sacrificing love. Love versus force. That is the whole story of Daniel and the revelation in a nutshell. And if that's the story, the crucial question then comes true to us as, what do you and I really know as Jesus' true revelation of God's character? When the final events of history unfold upon the world, each of us will act out our picture of God. Each of us will either side on the side of force and coercion or on the force of love. We will either want to be free to violate religious freedom in order to preserve ourselves or we will stand faithfully for liberty of conscience in harmony with God's coercive love. And on that note, the world will end. Sister, that was a wonderful ceremony, wasn't it? Oh, yes, I agree. I fell into luck. I myself. Before we leave, we just like to thank everyone who would have participated at the Morality March and the Global Youth League. Thanks from the South Korean Conference. Also, the Parkland. Also, some dates to keep on your calendar. March 30th. On this day, you will have our perfect day and adventure of day. Right at the Constantine Park in Okoya. Bring your friends, your neighbors, your family, and enjoy a wonderful experience. Just one more thing to note. At the end of July, going into the early, early August, we'll be having our camp meeting. But it's important to note, a very important note for our young people. The Bible-based messages of experience that the BDM will be incorporated into camp meeting this year. So it's an experience you definitely would not want to miss. So that's not less than your calendar one time, so you wouldn't forget. Thank you very much. I am Darius Edwards. And I'm Rachel Spine. Do enjoy the rest of your life.